Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining. I have a small secret to you. Uh, this is my first ever conference talk. And I... <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm not at all excited to be here. I'm terrified. <laughs> I was, if I was a type of person who is running away things, I would be halfway to Finland by now. But I hope that you can still enjoy this and get something out of this. Yeah. Today's agenda, I'm going to talk about, uh, oh, okay, this is kind of divided in half. First part is very generic, and I'm going to talk something about what is a power management IC and why those are done. And the second part will be about the drivers and mostly about the regulator framework and how the, the uh, regulator framework notifiers can be used to inform about the abnormal conditions in the, in the hardware. Uh, the title of the, this uh, talk was that uh, Linux power from the perspective of a PMIC vendor. And there's a reason why there's this from the perspective of a PMIC vendor. I'm working for a PMIC vendor. Uh, and uh, we do PMICs, and I know the PMIC side of things usually. But I don't know where our systems are used so well. So while I can tell you how you can provide these notifications from the hardware point of view, I cannot tell you what you should be doing with those notifications. And in that sense, I would hope that some of the audience could, uh, could, could give me some kind of ideas where this can be used and, and uh, how this can be used and where they are used and if they are used. So about me, as mentioned, uh, I'm working for a PIMIC vendor. Of course, ROM is doing also many other components. Um, I'm mostly doing the device drivers. And I haven't been actually touching PMIX in maybe almost two years. But uh, in any case, I expect to be back on the, that, that, that area also. So before the, the, before the uh, Rome, before joining the Rome, I have been working for the Nokia. And uh, currently, I'm mostly, mostly doing upstreaming work on the Rome side. And then, when I tell people that I'm doing uh, power management related issues or, or drivers, people are often thinking that, what? Where do you need power management drivers or, or power, power? You just plug in the cord and things work. So this is a bit simplistic. Simplistic picture because um, real world SOCs might look something like this. There are usually multiple power, power rails that are needed with different voltages and different control requirements. And there are specific timings that are required when startup sequences and shutdown sequences are done. This is actually a picture from one of the, one of the PMIC specifications, and I'm not going through it, just showing you that there are these timing, quite strict timing requirements. For, for how things are done. Uh, on top of these uh, timings and, and power, re power requirements, which are kind of critical, there are also functional uh, requirements for powering up and shutting down devices. People tend to, do, tend to want, for example, so power savings. Uh, my wife tells me that we need to do power saving. She is the one who is paying the electricity bill. Maybe this has something to do with it. People want to, to wake up their systems at given time, maybe Monday, 6 o'clock. They want to wake up systems when, when lead is opened or something else is done. People want to have battery-operated uh, setups where the, where the batteries are charged. There is a need for watchdogs, functional safety, monitoring the hardware state, status, and so on. So this is the need where, where uh, or, or what, what has been um, resulting the PMIX. So if we would be doing all of those things with discrete components, it would be a quite big PCB area that would be needed and so on. So P 
PIMICs are basically ICs that are incorporating all of these functions into one chip. And this is, they are, in, in many cases, they are having watchdogs and RTC, RTC clocks and, and other stuff there. Okay, for this kind of uh, ICs, where we have multiple different functional blocks, uh, you definitely need some drivers. And I'm going to show you, or I'm going to just show you quickly about the MFD and then I will be going in the regulator subsystem directly. I will be skipping most of the other, other things. So when we are having multiple functional blocks in the IC, it's usually a clever idea to make it an MFD device. Where the, uh, we have the MFD core device, which is, which is uh, not a thing as a lease is, but, but it's, it's not really a device, but it's something that is waking up all these um, sub-devices and probably creating the interrupt controller code there and, and maybe handling generic device tree stuff. Any ideas uh, why it is usually nice to do this as MFD devices? Oh, there are probably many, many reasons, but I have one on my mind. And hardware people are expert on reusing blocks. So when they invent the next generation of the, of the IC, uh, they are usually reusing the, the parts from the from the existing ICs, and when we have been using the MFD and done these uh, uh, sub-devices in, in own uh, platform devices, we can reuse those quite easily by just doing another MFD core and, and making only new drivers for, for really changed parts. Then to the, the, the regulator subsystem. And regulator uh, subsystem is basically twofolded, or, or business of two, or actually more than two devices. So there, on the one hand, there is the, the provider device, the regulator device, and then there are the consumers. And uh, regulator framework is something that is sitting between these uh, actual regulator device, which is controlling the regulator hardware, and then the devices that are consuming the power from the regulator, so that uh, consumer drivers can be asking or requesting uh, for example, enabling the power or disabling the power or changing the voltages. And the regulator framework is sitting there between uh, regulator driver and the consumer driver for a reason. There might be multiple uh, devices connected to one regulator, and it means that uh, you need some kind of bookkeeping that who needs these regulators enabled and who wants them to disabled so that you won't disable power from the devices that are still being used. And this is actually a nice slide. I'm proud of this. I don't know if this needs any explanations. So in self-contained slide, but uh, in any case, regulator subsystem, as many other subsystems in kernel are operated by this uh, callback function so that the regulator driver is, also is um, giving out the functions which are doing the specific operations by writing the hardware registers, for example, enabling and disabling and so on. This uh, regulator operator, uh, operation struct is embedded or pointer to, pointer to that is put in the regulator descriptor and this is registered via regulator register function. After that, your regulator will be known by the core and the core start um, give the control to users or whoever is requesting this control. There are usually multiple regulators in one power management IC. So you will see probably multiple regulator register calls in, in the probe function of the, of the regulator IC, the PIMIC IC driver. This is something that Mark, I was asking Mark that uh, if he would be nice, to, nice enough to check that I don't speak any nonsense here. And Mark told me, you, you, I suppose you know Mark. Mark is maintaining the regulator subsystem. So he told me that uh, there is not so much nonsense, but please add something about the constraints. This is why this slide is here. Uh, regulators are, can have constraints. You can give kind of uh, boundaries, limits, 
within, the, which, within which those regulators must operate for quite obvious safety reasons, for example. So you don't want to fry your devices. You can get, give these kinds of constraints from the device tree or from the initialization data. And core is parsing the device tree and getting the initialization data. And it is not forwarding uh, requests that are not within the constraints to the regulator driver. So the core is already stopping this, um, this, this um, bad things from happening. OK, then to the, the, the second part, which is kind of considering these abnormal conditions. And first thing is that uh, we want to detect the unexpected things. And in Linux, we are dividing these unexpected things uh, to three severity categories. There are protection, error, and warning. And the protection is something uh, that when we are getting over the protection limit, the hardware is shutting down the regulator automatically. Software has no kind of interaction there. Error level is something where uh, system is of the specs so that it's assumed that the hardware is no longer working correctly. But the, but the hardware is no, it's not uh, shutting down the regulator. So software should be doing some kind of uh, some kind of operation to, to mitigate the errors or to, to at least try to save the, save the hardware. And finally, there is this warning, which is, uh, I, I wrote that this is newish because um, it's no longer new, I think. It has been added in maybe 5.14. But this is, uh, the idea of the warning is that it will be informing that something is off the spec, but the hardware is still not probably broken. The, but, um, some use case where you might be willing to use warning is, for example, if you have some reference voltage to some measurement device and you get the warning that this reference voltage has not been good enough. So you want to drop maybe some measurements if the voltage, reference voltage has been changing too much or something like that. Setting these limits uh, can be done via device tree. And there is this format of the property, which is the regulator event, and then the severity, and then the unit. And um, the, the event itself can be one of those three. It, uh, sorry, uh, one of yeah, one of those three: over voltage, under voltage, or temperature. And over current is of course also four. I can count. Yeah. And of course, we give a value for these properties. And zero and one are special values. Zero meaning disable, one meaning enable. All the rest are the, the actual limit value to be uh, configured in the hardware. Then the question, what should we do if the hardware is not uh, supporting the requested uh, limits? If, if the user wants that, we will have the protection enabled for five volts, for example but the hardware cannot support that. Your device tree says that we, we want to do that, but hardware is not supporting it. Uh, that's a good question. I don't have a good answer. I see three options. One is, of course, to abort things and return error. Not good idea in the regulator probe because the system might not get come up. Another option is ignore it silently. Not good option, option because then the user might expect that things are not getting wrong. Or, or there's some protection in place if things get wrong. And currently, we are just printing an error and proceeding, or warning and proceeding. Um, from the driver side, uh, these uh, limits need to be, of course, written in the hardware. And we have these callback functions in the, uh, in the same place where the rest of the regulator operations are. And, uh, these callbacks will be then used to do write these configuration values in the hardware when core is, uh, core is reading the device tree and then calling these callbacks. And there is actually some ongoing work by Benjamin to do, uh, do some runtime uh, stuff, enabling and disabling these monitoring features by the core when the voltages are changed, for example, or, or regulators are enabled or disabled because some of the hardware is such that if you have these 
protections enabled when you are changing voltages, the hardware might be uh, getting errors there and shutting down the system, for example. So Benjamin is doing some, some uh, upstreaming work for this. And then, of course, this uh, as, uh, is, is this, um, as mentioned uh, earlier, these operations are embedded in the regulator description and then call, call, we are calling this regulator register and we have the constraints in place when the regulator has been probed. I have an example here about um, how these limits might be set, but I think that I will skip it. Then there is basically two, two types of, uh, or two ways to inform these um, abnormal situations. There are errors and there are notifications. Errors are basically just state information in the regulator core and it must be pulled by consumers. There's, there's no way to, that the core will be informing that, hey, now I have error there, but this must be pulled. Uh, this is, of course, clever because sometimes the hardware does not have interrupts, for example, the signal that there is error, so, so we need some kind of other mechanism to do that. But polling is not always preferred. We might want to save the cycles, so we have the notifications also. And this is typically used when the hardware can provide interrupts about these uh, uh, error conditions for, or, or shots. In many cases, the, the power management ICs are done in such a way that the hardware is not actually releasing the interrupt until the error condition has been cleared. So, if you won't be, or if you don't be careful, there your your processor will be sitting in the interrupt loop and not doing any mitigations, at least for the problem. So, you need to have some mechanism to to prevent that. Typically by keeping the interrupts masked and so on. Here we have just a list of the the errors. You can go and read them from code, but they are basically the under voltage our overcurrent, over voltage and, and temperature errors. And we also have the similar list for the notifications, but there are also other notifications in the kernel, not only these um, notifications, but that what we are giving when this something is, is wrong. So not all the notifications are error notifications. We are also providing um, this kind of helper function uh, to do, send out the notifications or fill the, the error flags. And this is done beca because the, the not all the drivers should be reinventing, for example, the wheel to, to prevent this IRQ storm when the hardware is not releasing the interrupt. And this, I think this is quite a typical case. So we are providing this kind of helper, which is uh, offloading some of the work from the drivers. Uh, I will explain the parameters later, but let's first see that what this helper is actually doing. So blue box here is the, the helper code and green box is what your driver should be still doing in order to use this helper. So what happens when we get the, the some abnormal situation in the hardware is that we get the interrupt there and the interrupt service routine is run from the helper code. The helper will be asking from this driver code that what happened, because it does not know this. The, the driver code should be reading out the power management IC registers to determine which regulator was uh, generating the, the interrupt and what was the reason for this interrupt. And this information is returned then to the helper function. And in addition, it's possible to configure some of the errors so that they are fatal. And if the, the error was fatal, uh, then there is two options. There's either this kind of die callback, which is populated by, by the driver. It's optional. Drivers do not need to implement it, but it might be implemented. And if it is implemented, then the, the uh, 
die callback will be called and it should be uh, saving the, the saving the hardware by doing some some whatever specific action it is and if the, the driver is telling that hey we have fatal error and if the die callback is not populated then the, the helper will be initiating emergency power of your system will be going down so you should be pretty careful when you are using uh, fatal errors or declaring some errors fatal because users won't be happy when their devices go down this is really the last resort if it was not fatal then we are sending out the notifications uh, to the consumers and then we are calling this re-enable callback if it has been implemented to see whether the error is still ongoing or not and if the error is uh, ongoing then we will not enable to in interrupt until the, the condition is okay and we will just uh, if it was not uh, yet cleared we will then schedule the the, the re-enable to be called again later to see if the things have been changing i think this is quite clear uh, how this helper is configured there is this kind of struct uh, regulator irq desk you will have name and fatal count and so on basic things to be interested in is probably this fatal count which if it is zero it means that this uh, this interrupt is never fatal the die won't be called and the emergency power off won't be done and this is basically 99 percent of the cases i think that that should be how it should be done but there is still this one percent uh -huh. then there is the reread millisecond which means that we wait uh, we will, if the reading of the um, BIMIC registers has been failing then we will re try reading those after this uh, this amount of time and this is actually something that was done in i think it was one of the qualcomm drivers before this helper was done and i just wanted to make this helper uh, compatible with this qualcomm driver so that qualcomm could be using for example this this with with their drivers as well then there's uh, the time how long the uh, interrupts will be disabled there is a uh, possibility to keep the, the handling of the errors which are informing or ignore the errors that are informing problems in the disabled regulators and finally the high prior is just some legacy stuff to do decide whether we are using the high, the, the high priority work queue or not this is also something that was done in this Qualcomm drive maybe it was Qualcomm don't kill me if it wasn't it's a bit bit difficult or a bit uh, dangerous to be mentioning company names here what else we have here is the data pointer which is usually the driver data driver this driver data is passed to those uh, callback functions when the helper is calling those callbacks and usually it is used so that the, the rec map pointer and things like that can be given to those callbacks and then there are those callbacks this uh, description for the helper is then uh, given for the uh, regulator IRQ helper function which will be uh, kind of enabling this it will be requesting the interrupts and then um, making it so that the, if the interrupt is coming this helper function will be which I was breaking down in the picture earlier it will be executed after this regulator IRQ helper function has been called this safety mechanism is in place other things that there needs to be is the IRQ information we want to know what IRQ is informing or for what IRQ we are now using this helper and array of regulators because as I mentioned some PIMIX have multiple regulators or, or most of the PIMIX have multiple regulators and one IRQ might be used to inform errors in the in the many of those and then of course the errors that the, the this interrupt can be uh, informing so this um, map event callback uh, is as i mentioned earlier it, this is this is done so that the interrupt reason can be found out and uh, 
when this is called, these parameters will be the pointer or to this regulator IRQ data structure, and then there will be this device mask. And device mask is informing that which of the regulators have faults uh, enabled, and the regulator IRQ data will be containing information like the regulator statuses. This is array of the status function statuses, and then the number of statuses, and again the data pointer and this OPAQ pointer. OPAQ, oh sorry, OPAQ is not pointer, it's long. This OPAQ is used basically only by the driver. It's not touched by the regulator core or this helper function. And its intended, intended use case is that uh, the regulator status registers can be stored there so that the re-enable function can be checking the statuses if they have been changed. And this error state, we have this array of error states and this error state is having the regulator device and then the active errors uh, and active notifications there, or notifications to be sent there. So the map event function when called from the by core should be filling out this information which is in this, in this structs to return the information to the uh, helper that these are the problems we have here. Then we have this uh, re-enable, which uh, task is basically just uh, to check if the state has changed, if it is now safe to enable interrupts again or not. Okay, and finally, if there is simple one-to-one uh, -one mapping from the interrupt to the regulator and the error, then this uh, regulator IRQ map event simple can be used as the map event function. We have provided also this kind of helper here. We have also an example about the, the mapping function. So this map event function, I hope you can still be awake. It has been a long week, I know. I can feel it myself, but let's try. So what the map event is doing, it is re reading out the status registers for this PD6576. And if the reading is failing, it will be returning this regulator failed retry value, which will be then used to determine whether this um, was successful or not. And the helper, if, 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 the, the, if this interrupt would be marked as fatal, to have the fatal criticality, and if we are returning this regulator failed retry to for, for this fail count times, then the emergency power of would be done. But in, in this case, we are not uh, setting this uh, interrupt ever as a fatal. Then we are checking uh, which of the regulators were the flagging the errors and uh, setting this device mask based on that. Actually, we are just checking if there was, was any of those. And it's setting this uh, status in this OPAQ, as I mentioned earlier, so that this OPAQ can be used by the re-enable. And here we are populating the device mask, which is telling which of the regulators had problems there. And finally, we are setting this array, uh, or this, this um, notification error information in this array of the uh, error statuses. In this case, we have a bit more complex. We don't directly assign the error values here to these notifs and errors members, because in our case, we do decision whether these interrupts are uh, warnings or errors at the probe time based on the device tree values. And uh, at the probe, we are then populating this R data information to, with, the, with the correct notification to send and with the correct error status to, to advertise. What we then do, we fill out this helper configuration struct. Uh, we set the, the time to keep the interrupts disabled for one second. And um, we are giving some name for this that is shown in the interrupt names. And then we are populating those callbacks I mentioned earlier. Then in a loop where we are uh, registering the regulators, we are adding uh, information about those regulators that uh, can be 
sending out these overvoltage problems and we are populating this array of those regulators so that we can give this to help a configuration later. And then we are setting the, the information, with, uh, information about the, the errors that this interrupt can be potentially uh, informing about. And this is used because otherwise the regulator core or the helper function would not know which status is to clear when the renable is telling that there is no more problems present. There might be, because of course there might be multiple interrupts which are all uh, telling that there are different problems. And if we did not populate this information, then all the problems should be cleared and maybe that, that, that's not the correct kind of thing to do. It seems that I'm ahead of time, so we have more time to discuss and, and questions. But to wrap this up, uh, basically, basically, as you know, Powering up a modern SOC is not simple anymore. It's not just plugging in the, in the power cord. The power management IC is um, something that is trying to integrate the features into one chip to save the, the uh, PCB area and, and to make it so that we don't need to design whole powering uh, stuff again for each SOC that we are using because quite many power management ICs can also um, change the startup and shutdown sequences. And some can even be extended so that you can chain multiple power management ICs together to get more of those outputs. So this and, and many PMIX have functional safety features and there is some exiting support in Linux kernel to notify about these, these uh, events. I hope you have some questions, and, and um, if there is no questions, I at least hope that uh, there are some ideas where these, uh, where these uh, events and notifications are used, because I, I assume that they exist in the kernel for a reason. I just don't know this reason. So I would be very interested in hearing if you have been ever using this and where these have been used. You've been using that stuff. For what, if I may ask? Can you tell it? Yeah, for that Polcom uh, regulator driver okay. <laughs> that yeah. you were mentioning. <laughs> yeah. Do you know how the consumers are using those events? Uh, I wrote the driver, so yes. <laughs> yeah, so you, you wrote also the consumer drivers? Yes. Great. So can you tell where they are, these are used? Uh, I actually don't really remember. That happened okay. like ten, uh, five years ago ago or something hmm? that happened like five years ago or something yeah 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 okay yeah and yeah it's a bit shady <laughs> yeah sorry yeah no problem there's at least one question this is more of a design question can you go to slide 22 please okay 22 <laughs> Yeah, this one. So I was looking at this uh, reread milliseconds, right? Yep. I was wondering, uh, this would also be useful, for example, for touch controllers, because they are also on I2C and sometimes the I2C is also flaky. Uh, would it be possible to move this closer to the core? This kind of a functionality, because it's not isolated to regulators. Good question. I, I probably need something like a few hours of sleep first and then I can <laughs> take a look at the code and tell you if I can move it or if I can plan it. But yeah, I, I, I at least won't say that this is not something that should be investigated. Yeah. So the I2C core supports that you add, um, you, you can qu quantify the number of rereads it should try, but this is not a good measure usually, but you can define a time frame how long it should try to retry. 
if that yeah. makes sense for touchscreen controllers that I don't know. But that is already in there. Yeah, okay. So basically this reread, okay, this is the time that we are waiting for the before rereading. And I think that for this Qualcomm driver that was mentioned, there was this kind of thinking that if, for example, the IC is overheating quite badly, then the reading out the registers might be failing. And that was basically the why the, the rereading, if the rereading was failing enough of times, then we will be doing this shutdown to try to save at least some of the hardware. So this information is passed to the I2C core already, isn't it? This is not in the I2C uh, core, but, uh, but, but you say that something is there. I think the difference is what you can tell the I2C core is for how long it should retry. And what you specify here is a, di in the wall. The way is a in discrete the wall. Uh, delay between the, yes. the, the, uh, the retries. And so this is, I think, driver specific and th that sh should not be in the I2C core because only the driver know what a reasonable delay between the reads is, right? Yeah, I think, but on Unless the other we hand... introduce new uh, callbacks which have all an additional parameter like, but yes. this would be like... Yes, no. yes. No. <laughs> Well, yeah, but maybe then you can deduplicate this functionality in the I2C core, right? I can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have uh, one more question, which is unrelated to this, and it's on slide 26. <laughs> <laughs> Marek, you are quite amazing on that. So I was curious about this one. Um, you have Regma read here, and uh, it probably returns some sort of an error, right? So how do you do uh, error propagation here? Because you obviously cannot do like return rat. You have to do like return regulator something here. Is the error just discarded from the regma breed? Uh, if regma breed is failing, yeah, yeah. So then we are sending uh, or returning this regulator failed retry. Yeah, but can we also propagate the error? Error from the help code. code. I think that it is silently ignored on, unless the, the uh, where I had this, this, this configuration here, unless this fatal count is populated. And if this fatal count is populated and you are failing to read more than the fatal count times in a row, then we will be doing this em emergency, uh, either the day, die callback or the shutdown. But otherwise, we are not, for example, printing anything from the, from the interrupt, I think. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, really uh, cool stuff. And uh, about the error on that slide 26, is there a reason? Is it a globe that is a global variable? It's not like the local to the function? Maybe someone else uses it Sorry, to get it later? Which? Red. Yeah. <laughs> Red. Uh, I think that this example might not be complete. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I had uh, actually I had more text on these slides first. And then I was re-reading re the instructions how to build this slide set, and there was this um, different kind of scale for the papers than, that I had been expecting. So I had to squeeze it even more. So there might be even less information in these okay, functions yeah. now. But I thought just maybe there is something like a get Erno after that that you can use to retrieve it, but it's fine. Yeah. So my question is uh, how regulator subsystem is connected to a cl clock subsystem, I think, because if we go to DVFS example, it's both simultaneous, like it's clock and regulators. Is it done on a higher level? Yeah, I think it's done in the higher level, yeah. And I think that you might have answered it there also. Is it so? Yeah. Um, so uh, the DVFS driver or the DVFS core handles both regulators and clocks. So 
if you're raising the frequency, it will first boost the voltage, then raise the clock. And if you're lowering the frequency, then it does it in the opposite order. So it's, it's handled at the DVFS core or CPU freight core level and not the individual subsystems. Thank you. Yeah. And also uh, one comment on the uh, regulator constraints. The constraints are supposed to um, describe the constraints of the regulator consumer. So if you're just copying the values from your PMIC data sheet, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so then you are not constraining anything. The hardware wouldn't be already constraining. So yeah, correct. You have asked at the beginning uh, about some examples for your abnormal events which can be used and uh, in some real case scenarios. And I know that in uh, automotive, we are using usually under voltage events, like in the car, there are a lot of under voltage events. And in this case, you should just execute as less as possible of preparation for uh, this kind of power loss. So, probably, for example, prepare EMMC that it will be disabled soon, just to avoid damage of EMMC, for example. Thank you. This makes sense because when I was first implementing this um, uh, safety stuff in a PIMIC, this was a PIMIC that was intended to be used in the automotive side. And I think that we had a customer request for these safety features there, but I have never heard why and what was used. So this makes kind of sense. Thank you. Exactly the information I was hoping to hear. <laughs> Last question then, because we're at time. So yeah, after previous uh, question, I just realized that in automotive, they also log all these under voltage, under over voltage errors uh, in the diagnostics information. So you can see that this block was under voltage or over voltage. I mean, at least in some cars, yeah. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. So thank you for joining.